So this section and the next section share a lot of overlap, um, if I recall correctly. And so we are starting in on page uh, page 117 and we are just gonna we are just gonna wander through this and I suspect we're probably gonna have more discussion than I have stuff prepared so um, oddly um, he makes a big deal out of uh, the dark Trinity and then he one of them one of the characters gets a second set of material right so uh, before under the second uh, the seducer he covered Asherah and then he makes the claim and I didn't you know like I shared before once I started messing around getting to know these Old Testament gods they all kind of mush together it's like a gumbo for me because I mean if I had time you know you, when you go to Samaria it's this and when they you hear about them in Rome and these things get attached and all these other things but um, so we get what he calls the transformer or Ishtar okay and so uh, anybody got any any uh, thoughts there on page 117 Well, Asherah was an Old Testament false god, for sure. But he does seem to know a lot of details, right? Yeah. He does seem to be... Uh, she does this, she does that. How do you know what she does? Well, it's an interesting question, right? <laughs> uh, either he is overshooting his material or he knows it better than we do. I mean, or some combination of the two. Um, and, and some of this is, you know, there are more, there are probably more texts floating around of these Sumerian and Akkadian and whatever gods. I mean, you, if you wanted to study Asherah or Ishtar, you could, you could step through these texts that have been preserved. And once he gets to the quote, we're going to look at some of the texts that have been preserved, okay? Um, but he, he certainly personifies her almost like a biography. Yeah, no, I mean, it's like right? he's talking like you could sit down next to her and ask her these questions. You know, right, so right. She's not a person. <laughs> right, right, right. Seems a little fixated. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, to, you know, it, it helps to make the book work, right? Mm hmm so that's part of his argument is it helps to make the book work. Now, whether you're convinced is another story, right? Whether you find it compelling. Now, I will say <laughs> of the three things that he's done so far, this one, this chapter touches on the stuff, you know, stock market bull, 1989, 1960s sexual revolution, uh, 1970s abortion, but this is the most recent stuff, right? So it adds a little bit of, like, I don't know, I find myself a little more sympathetic in this one. Uh, not necessarily that Ishtar is hiding behind everything, but this one just seems a little fresher. Current. <laughs> more current, right? Because we've, we've been talking about the breakdown of the family forever. We've been talking about abortion forever. We've been talking about materialism and, you know, what were the other bits... Uh, for bail, power, or whatever, forever. And this this section seems a lot more al fresco. Is that what they say? Al fresco, yeah. fresh. Well, right? it's more known, but it's been going on forever. <laughs> yeah, right. That's what. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that was more out in the open. It was like. Yeah. Been, All right. So one seventeen. Any any thoughts? Um, he says down there, I'm a man, I am a woman, and her link to the planet Venus. She was known as the morning star, but also the evening star. This In this was a clue into her nature, duality. She would inhabit the two ends, the polar opposites of the spectrum. 
So that's part of his building her character profile. All right, next page. Now here's where he starts quoting the stuff, okay? Now the first, um, the first thing on the sheet here, it says Ashir Namshub to Anana. I guess that's another one of her names. And Ashir Namshub is kind of like a song of praise or whatever, okay? And how this works is, you know, when they will find old bits of material, you know, there'll be words missing, there'll be segments missing. So when you start reading some of this stuff, you know, you'll see like in the dot, dot, dot here in that first one, when I dot, 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 there's probably something unreadable in the manuscript or whatever they found, okay? So you get little fragments, but eventually you get enough of a taste to kind of get the overall flow. And so um, he quotes, when I sit in the ale house, I am a woman and I am an exuberant young man. So that's down here in this middle section, this 16 to 22, okay? Well, the, the whole fragment here, if we start from the beginning up here, it says, when I, as I travel by boat, when I, as I travel by boat, when I, the queen, journey to Abzu, I don't know, when I enter the house of Enlil, that was probably another god, I am indeed the queen who is preeminent in the mountains. When I stand before the face of Enlil, I am indeed the emanating light. When I stand in the mouth of the battle, I am indeed also the foremost one of all lands. When I stand in the thick of the battle, I am indeed also the very guts of battle, the heroic strength. When I walk about at the rear of the battle, I am indeed also the flood bearing. When I take my stand behind the battle, I am the woman who comes. So uh, if this is a him describing her, she obviously thinks she's a lot of things, right? Okay, when I sit in the ale house, I am a woman and I am an exuberant young man. When I am present at a place of quarreling, I am a woman, a perfect figure. When I sit by the gate of a tavern, I am a prostitute familiar with the Venus and the friend of a man, the girlfriend of a woman. I am the milk of the God. I am the preeminent in the mountains. I am the milk of the God of Dumuzid. And that's another God, I think. I am preeminent in the mountains, the mountains in my hands, the mountains at my feet. Elam in my hands, I have pointed my dagger in my belt. The gods are small birds, and I am the falcon. You know, so, yeah, she does say this kind of gender switching kind of bit, but she also thinks she's all the things, right? I mean, that's, that's what's the feeling you get. Who wrote this? It was a person who wrote this. <laughs> right, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Well, no, and that's it's probably the high priest who wrote it. Right, the yeah. Business yeah. Home. I think it was a human. It wasn't... I think uh, Reverend Khan is taking it a little too literally because <laughs> you can read this as saying that, um, or understanding it as, in the alehouse, you have men and women, and they drink, and they get up to all kinds of stuff. And she's there. They have since the first alehouse opened. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't, mean that, that doesn't mean that she's... That doesn't mean that she's... Both. It's just right. that she yeah. encompasses both in terms of, you know, her influence or whatever in there. She, yeah, she almost yeah. presents herself as kind of this life force where people are arguing. I'm there. Where there's a woman there, I'm there. Where there's a man there, I'm there. Yeah, right? I'm all over. <laughs> but so this is, and, and again, you're right. This was a hymn, probably written by a priest. You know, I don't, you know, attributing these words to her. Um, but, you know, I think he makes a little better of a case with this one than he did with the previous two, okay? Um, so that's the quote there. Um, and, and, but if you got, I think if you, if you simply read this, you would think that's the only thing she's about. But she's not, you know? Also war, right? So, you know, he's, uh, he's, He's kind of taken one aspect of it and amplified it. It's not that the aspect isn't there. It's just that if you just read nothing but this, you would think that Ishtar was the one that specialized in this, and this is all she did, right? I mean, I would get that impression. Maybe not, okay? All right, so that's the quote. Um, and then, let's see. Yeah, so that's the quote. And I, you know, he did footnote these things, and... And, and it's there, right? It's there. Um, 
Then he says, to turn a man into a woman, joining the masculine and the feminine in one was in many ways what Ishtar was all about. Uh, it was her nature to cross lines, transgress boundaries, break conventions, blur distinctions, and merge opposites to confuse and invert. It was not her nature to accept reality as it was. It was in her nature to bend it, transform it, conform it to her will and, her, and desire. If her will was to be a woman, she would be a woman. But if it was to be a man, she would become a man. She was the goddess of transmutation and metamorphosis. Okay? Um, and so, I mean, I, I don't want to belabor it, but that's where he's going with it, right? And he doesn't, once he kind of makes this initial statement, um, then he starts to say, well, this is who she was, and this is what she did, and what if she were to make a comeback? What would it look like? Because that's his style, right? That's what he's doing, okay? So the Transformer returns, okay? Uh, page, uh, chapter 28. And so what it, what it gets down to is a blurring of maleness and femaleness or a switching of maleness and femaleness, okay? So that's what he's saying that her, her, one of her big deals is, is to switch this. Now, she was also known as the female goddess of war. Um, now, in the ancient Near Eastern world, who went to war? Men. men. The men. Until Mulan. <laughs> but even then, she tried to pass herself off as a guy, right? Okay. Um, okay, so, so there's already some interesting things going on there, okay? So he's going he's gonna to make... He's going to start making this case where she's all about, for lack of a better term, gender bending and erasing distinctions and uh, attributing the, the actions of one gender to the other gender, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he starts talking about the masculinization of women, okay? Uh, weakening the male-female paradigm, okay? Then, of course... We talk about the workplace, right? Because in the in the way the culture talks, um, that would be that's that's part of the culture war that happened in the sixties. But it's 80s, interesting that that's 90s. a reversal. It used to be women glorifying women, and all of a sudden it switched the other way now. As a as a, what do you mean? Well, there, you know all the women's rights and everything that were going on, and now it's. I know I've read comments. Why are why are they trying to destroy womanhood? <laughs> okay, that's it's the, just kind of a reversal. That's of interesting, what happened right? Kind of recently. Okay, so the, in the background here, and I didn't chase it very far. I'll just give you the broad categories. Is you know what they call waves of feminism. So the first wave of feminism was like the Susan B. Anthony era, um, early things and the second wave comes along and then third wave is we're on the we're either on the beginning of the fourth wave or back into the third wave and each of these things did different things function different things so this is kind of second wave era feminism stuff that he's talking about i think first or second wave feminism stuff so he says um uh Ishtar, down there in Ishtar in the workplace, Ishtar has been referred to as an independent woman due to the fact that in the end she was never bound to any one man and as one associated with prostitution, she was economically self-supporting. So at the same time, the sexual revolution was taking hold. There was a growing movement calling for women to become like Ishtar, economically independent of men. Millions of women left their homes to join the workforce. Uh, the decline of marriage only furthered the trend. Divorce had increased the number of women without husbands, many of them single mothers. They now had to replace the functions of missing husband to take on the traditionally male roles of provider and protector. So right there, so he's already talking about something. He's talking about traditionally traditional roles. So he's coming into this discussion assuming them. Okay? Yeah, but you know what he's not talking about? He's not talking about... Uh, sociological, economic, and uh, military phenomena. For example, World War I, a lot of women had to go into the workforce because the men were going to war. 
in the mm -hmm. World War, War II. Get Rosie the Riveter, right? The same thing. Right. 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 And and you know, so I mean it's like he's not taking that into account. Women got a taste of what it means to be valued for more than just being mothers. Yeah, because we all know that's wives. not worth anything, right? <laughs> no, no, but, it's not that. But I understand it. I understand yeah. it, right? Um, and the thing that I wrote down at the end is Proverbs 31, right? So you look at the Proverbs 31 woman described there, and she is definitely centered around her family, but she also buy, considers and buys a field, yeah. right? It's balanced. Right? So, you know. She manages a workforce. She does all, the, all kinds of other things. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, again, uh, he's, 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 he, he's an astute observer of these trends. I don't know that you necessarily can attribute them to Ishtar, right? Okay, uh, role and function affect identity and even nature. The identity and nature of women began changing. Women were encouraged and instructed to become aggressive, competitive, dominant, and fierce. Move on. <laughs> right? Okay. So here, I mean, you've got a clash between what he's assumed as the standard, typical, uh, traditional masculine and feminine roles. And he's, he hasn't laid it out. He hasn't made his case for it. I happen to think he's substantially right about it, but, um, but he's assumed it. Okay. And so, I mean, that, that does that does bring a question in my mind is if you uh, biblically and what the question that, that where the where the discussion is is biblically does do you are you convinced that the scripture delineates a difference between men and women and their functions okay if you don't see that, then you're going to say men and women are interchangeable. And that's kind of where we are culturally now, right? We try to be that way, but it doesn't, it doesn't always work, right? You know, there's a, there's a never-ending battle of, of the sexes, and, uh, you know, the snarky men say, well, if women want to be 100% equal, then they need to be 50% of the trash worker people and 50% of the sewer working people, right? And 50% of the lumberjacks, and, right? Then you get snarky women doing the same, you know, there's, there's, there's the, no way the, the other result is that the uh, birth rate has drastically dropped in every Western country now. <laughs> we, are so not doing ourselves any, we are not doing ourselves any favor by, uh, by not having any more children. Because oddly enough, that seems to be the way the planet seems to be able to perpetuate itself. There's this, again, I, there's two ways to look at it. You can look at influences of, like some outside influence. Or you can look and say, you know, a lot of these thing ha things happen because of the breakdowns in societal norms. And those breakdowns take place all over the place, in different families. All kinds, Back, if you, if you go back before World War II, right, the Depression days and before that, people didn't divorce because they needed to stay together. A woman couldn't be on her right, own. Right, right. So she put up with a lot of garbage from her husband, alcoholism, uh, physical abuse, yeah. you know, a beating. And, and all. They put up with a lot of stuff that they don't put up with anymore, and, and I don't think they should. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's all of these factors, you know, like um, the influence of the church has definitely decreased since the end of World War II. And whose fault is that? Is it but, some outside influence? But money is the other big factor because the Johnson Warren Power did, according to many of the, the black leaders, destroyed the family structure in the black community. Yeah, there are Suddenly multiple. all this money was given out and it just destroyed their culture. They had, I know one example I heard was Memphis had all kinds of flourishing black businesses. They went out of business when the money started to flow from the Johnson Poverty Program. No, that's not true. 
they went out of business because of economic and um, what do you call it, uh, realtor. Uh, well, that's not what the black leaders say. Well, <laughs> the ones I heard. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, the, the black family in a lot of ways is still as strong as it ever was, but there are a lot of influences in the community. I mean, redlining. Okay, yeah, we could live in 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 uh, Saddlebrook. You go through there. You, you find any people that are other than white in there? No. You go a lot of other places where the, the realtors and everything said that, oh yeah, we'll sell the white people, but we won't sell the black people in this oh, area. Yeah, but that's not that's not happening in Saddlebrook. There are other no, influences but, there. Yeah, right? but I'm just saying is, is that those kinds of things play a role yeah. in terms of what happens to a community. There are multiple factors. Mm. And to reduce a lot of current issues down to single factors is to not do <clears throat> justice to the actual issue. Yeah. So uh, we have wound up. Uh, oh, we we're talking about money. That's how we got there. Okay. So, so you know, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about this gender bending stuff. Um, and that didn't just happen when Bruce Jenner decided. I mean, it didn't just happen then, right? Now, now in the 70s and 80s, there were plenty of rock stars who would gender bend, but they did it. Why? Entertainment and shock value. Because, yeah. because they were riding it to the bank, right? Yeah. It was a yeah. very rock and roll thing to do. Right. And none of them thought, you know, when, when uh, whoever would, dress, you know, put on, a, put on eye makeup, they wouldn't say, I really feel like a woman. No. I really feel like I should be a woman. They're doing it because they know it's transgressive. And that's always the rock and roll way, right? <laughs> the rock and roll way is, you know, it's always just anybody who's in rock and roll, you're just the latest in a long string of people giving the finger to the establishment. Just get in line with all the people who've gone before you. We've seen it, right? And they We've have to have a new gimmick. New gimmicks, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, speaking of establishment, again, <laughs> I grew up with President Kennedy being assassinated his brother Robert being assassinated, Martin Luther King being assassinated, the Vietnam War. I'm reading a book now about all the lies that were told to get that going, that, that wound up you know, getting that situation. So we began to see as citizens, we began to see that we couldn't necessarily trust our government like we did before. Like during World War II, we didn't know really questioned Right. The government and what they did is subsequent history. You know Nixon, Watergate. You know, yeah. bang on down down yeah. down the years, and, and I, you and I have lived through that. He's lived through it. Yeah. We all remember, and that really tends to undercut your faith and trust in society and government. Yeah, and in in, in tradi quote, traditional institutions, right? Yeah. Um, now we have a diversion here. <laughs> Who was? Ishtar the Dalaran. It says Enlil here, and it says uh, Anu, who was the top one. I've, Two different. <laughs> I forget. <laughs> I, I do not know. Maybe one of them is remember. the male and one of them is the female. Maybe that maybe that's a mother and a father that they're yeah. talking about. Yeah, it, it it does say Enlil here, who was the son of Anu. And in, in this text, it says he's in for Dollar Manu. So, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't know which I, is I, I think Jonathan Kahn was much more on the mark in his first book, The Harbinger. Did you read that? Yeah. No? Okay, because in that one, his, his premise is, is that like Israel had gone astray from God and God had removed his protection from Israel and all these things started to happen to the, come mm -hmm. to the nation. Uh, that eventually wound up in them being uh, taken into exile in Babylon. Yeah. So his point was that because America has gone off the rails with, as far as God's concerned, that God withdrew his blessings and protection from America. So that's why we got the Twin Towers coming down. That was a seminal event in history and a, and a big part of his book. What followed on that? War, economic collapse, 2008, war in 2004. You know, it, we were over in Afghanistan for 20 years. Well, it, it's, 
I, I doubt there's ever been a war-free period for a very, very, yeah. very, like, right. hundreds but, but and hundreds of you, years. You showed time. That, 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 look, this, the exact same things happened to the Israelite nation because of their attitude and the way, you know, God was trying to get their attention by letting things happen and hopefully mm -hmm. they would realize that and turn, turn around, you know, but they didn't. Yeah. And that's what his book was about. And I thought it was very on the mark. Yeah. I thought it was very helpful. But yeah. this, I'm finding it so much here. Huh? I, I just don't know where he is with this. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. All right, so Rise of Warrior Women, that's on page 122. Uh, since Ishtar was the goddess of war, she was a warrior. It describes the ferocity of her. Um, you know, so the warrior women became part of popular culture and entertainment where physical combat had once been the domain of men. So we didn't have, uh, so again, he's operating. And again, the, uh, there's a prohibition maybe in Leviticus about women not wearing the things that belong to a man and, it, and it's in terms of combat dress. And that's why in ancient Israel, um, the women were not drafted to serve. Okay, And so there again, the question is, is that a description of the way things happen or was this God's design for His people, right? If that's God's design for His people that only the men fight, then, you know, then what are we doing having our, well, I mean, I mean, I know what we're doing having women in our military is that we, although we as a nation in our founding document talks about God, we don't say who he is or how we can know him, right? <laughs> we, we've just, we're just satisfied with this amorphous, undefined higher power. And once that happens, you get in this state that we're in, right? So, uh, so the military, the military bit, um, marriage and family, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then he says, Ishtar had her way with the women by, uh, by getting them into the workforce and essentially masculinizing them. So the next thing will be emasculating the men. Okay. <clears throat> emasculating the men. So the goddess was never at ease with masculinity if it was not her own, if it belonged to a man. Her lovers were dominated by her, intended to suffer a tragic fate. Uh, with regard to men, Ishtar was dangerous and deadly. She was their emasculator. The Hittite hymn to the goddess describes her as the one who will grind away from man manliness. Okay. Feminization of men. Um, I want you, the, 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 the sentence right before that, it was Ishtar's power and desire to turn not only woman into a man, but a man into a woman. So again, you know, in a world where we say, you know, a bajillion years ago, there was just kind of nothingness and it was all constant, all this nothingness was concentrated down to a little itty bitty thing the size of a smaller than a head of a pin. And all of a sudden it just blew up everything. And then just over years and years and years of randomness, this turns into this and this turns into that and this turn, and pretty soon you get Dr. Pepper and iPhones and people. <laughs> well, it's little wonder that if that's the steady diet we give, you came from nothing, meaningless nothingness. There's no real meaning or, or anything, so. Might as well just be what you want. You can switch back and forth. As a matter of fact, we switched from inert matter to a little protozoa, and then we switched into a fish, and then we switched into this tree of things, you know. So it wouldn't surprise us that we would think in 2023, I can just be who I want, right? Culturally. The only problem is it kind of runs against reality, right? Because I'm never going to dunk a basketball. I just won't. I just won't. I just won't. I just won't. Okay. Feminization of men, okay? Uh, toxic masculinity. Well, 
Certainly there's m more of that around than we need, right? <laughs> Uh, with women increasingly taking on the roles of men with marriage continuing to weaken, more marriages were ending in divorce and others never starting. Men were increasingly separated from their traditional role and functions of provider and protector. So here's that role again, right? Provider and protector. So as roles and roles of nature were being altered, so too were, so too were those of men. And so, uh, you know, that's what he's getting at. Ishtar has her way with the women by turning them more menish. Ishtar has her way with the men by turning them more womenish, or female, or demasculinizing, emasculating them. Okay? Uh, the reprogramming of boys. That's what he gets to. If boys displayed typical male characteristics, they would likely be reproved. They were less and less encouraged to succeed. They began falling further and further behind in their education. Uh, and this, um, there's an interesting, uh, she calls herself the factual feminist. Her name is Christine Summers Hoff. Christine Hoff Summers, Summers Hoff. And she, uh, I don't know what her faith commitments are, but she, she's on board with this bit, that um, the constant hounding of boys to not be boys is getting them essentially behind in school. And, and again, there's all sorts of things like, you know, the, the typical boy wants to kind of throw things and make swords out of sticks and mess around and have them sit like this for eight hours in school is pretty challenging, right? So again, here you've got multiple, multiple factors, right? If you're gonna have mass education, everything can't be tailored all the time, right? I mean, it's just, it's mind boggling the factors that go into all this stuff. All right, so she's talking about, um, you know, boys falling behind in education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think a majority of the, of the uh, college degrees earned in the last five or 10 years haven't been male, earning them. Um, so second paragraph there, as for the male disposition to fight and protect the impulse are now being channeled into video games, wow. He's probably not wrong on that one. <laughs> and interestingly enough, though, the, the notion about fighting and winning is still there, right? Or exploring in, or adventure in games, you mean? In games right? Mm -hmm. um, and she's probably talking about shooter games and things like that, where that, that traditional aggressive male stuff is still there. It's just all sitting in your basement, <laughs> right? So the risk isn't there. Right, um, and a lot of it is down in the basement. It's not out on the football field. That's what I'm basketball. saying. That's what I'm saying. So the, the, that same kind of notion to conquer and build, and it's all in the video game stuff. But there's no risk there. The worst risk is you, man. My thumb. Man, my thumb really hurts today. My blister. It, it fell off last week, and I'm making a new blister. I mean, well, okay. Which, if we're going to be pod people in a hundred years and everybody's going to live just hooked into their computer, that might be all right. But I don't think that's probably going to happen. All right. And then uh, the just the ubiquity of online por pornography and all this kind of congeals uh, in the male world to. And again, the pornography bit is um, having some of the experiences without the relational risk of being with another real person. Right, it's the same. It's kind of an extension of the video game thing. You're still doing a thing. It's just you're you're separated from the real world about it. Okay. Well, it makes me better. I took the the two boys that were attached to the fair. The little one wanted a sword, but then he saw a machine gun and he was lost. <laughs> so we came home with the machine gun. <laughs> yeah, and and you know. A lot of the discussion about the transgender stuff is, I mean, when it boils down to it, the super duper activists say gender is com nearly completely a social construct. And what they mean by that is, oh, men and women act a certain way they do because their society, their, lo their local culture tells them to act that way. And I, you know, 
I don't know. With that example. No, I, I mean, I've got boys and girls, grand, <coughs> excuse me, grandchildren. But all, the boys always went for the cars, you know, the trucks, the car. I mean, one was fastened by garbage trucks for years. Now, do you think that's because somebody was no. whispering to him at night and saying, <laughs> no. trucks and no. cars yeah. and tools and stuff, yeah. no. right? I think it's just innate. <laughs> There's it's something. Yeah. So again, we're back to, you know. But it's more, is it a more reinforcement because men or women are different in the way they think? approach problems, a whole lot of differences, but society reinforces some norms that they want them to act like, and right. they, those are disappearing. And so, you know, I, 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 think, I think you can probably make the case that, you know, in Scotland, the men wear kilts, and over here, that kind of looks like a skirt. <laughs> but in Scotland, I don't think the women wear kilts, so there's still a distinction, even though in our culture, a kilt looks like a skirt that a woman would wear, right? But even in that culture, there's still men wear this, women wear this, right? And we are probably a little bit past the time when it was scandalous for you ladies to wear pants, <laughs> right? Because that's what men... So there's a, there is a certain aspect of how we move and behave is a little bit cultural conditioned, right? But... You can't just take that and say it's all 100% cultural conditioned, right? But how do you move culture? That's a, that's a big issue. How can you move it? Uh, well, I think you probably hook them all into one of these that's things. That's why maybe what he's saying is true. You hook them into a television, right? Massively, uh, yeah. massively forming. Yeah. Uh, kids that live in Africa who would have never known who Michael Jackson was can dance like Michael Jackson because they see him on the internet, right? Yeah. The inter electronic stuff, electronic media is a culture equalizer. If you got access to the internet, you can have all sorts of stuff from all over. All right. So androgynous there, chapter 30. Um, the Asanu, Kurguru, Kalu, and Gaia, Gala. So these are um, temple servants, okay? Known for pu publicly bending and breaking the perimeters and definitions of gender. They were men who had taken on the appearances and attributes of women. As Ishtar had masculinized herself, her male priests had feminized themselves or had been feminized. They make themselves to appear as women. They dressed in women's garments. They made up their faces. Today they can be called cross-dressers, etc. All right. Now, the ancient Greco-Roman theater, only men were in it. But again, when they put on a mask and played a woman's part, when they went home, they didn't say, I'm probably actually a woman, right? <laughs> Just like Mrs. Doubtfire, you know, well, yeah, Robin Williams dressed like a woman for an extended period of time. But when he got home, he didn't say, I'm actually a woman, right? You know, and some of the snarky debates will say, you know, if you're against this, then you must not like Mrs. Dar Doubtfire. Well, no, he was trying to be close to his kids, right? I mean, it's, there's a difference here, right? Mm -hmm. There's a difference here. And so androgyny. Um, so this is kind of the second, uh, the second bit here, I think. Uh, Inanna was entrusted by Enlil and Ninlil with the capacity to gladden the heart of those who revere her in her established residences, but not to soothe the mood of those who did not revere her in her well-built houses. To turn a man into a woman and a woman into a man to change one into the other, to make young women dress as men on their right side, to make young men dress as women on their left side, to put spindles on the hands of men. So again, that's a reversal of the roles, right? And to give weapons to the women, to see that women amuse themselves by using children's language, to see that children amuse themselves by using women's language. So it's, it's about bending and reversing the roles, okay? Um, so it talks about androgyny. Obviously, you know, one of the kings of that for a while was David Bowie. I mean, he was kind of, right? Um, and certainly all those 80 hair metal bands, guys like Poison and Rat would tease their hair up super high and wear makeup, right? But again, they were riding it to the bank, okay? Uh, next page, the problem of biology. Um, 
female icons of popular music and culture, etc. Unlike the, those early generations now re reveled in appearing wild, unruly, shocking, vulgar, and aggressive. Well, again, that is what popular culture is about, right? You won't get noticed. I mean, there's a million bands out there. You got to do something. You got to do something. Oh, going on right now. You got to do something. Um, you know, one of my one of my things is, uh, where'd you get your goth clothes at the mall? Okay, by the time you get your goth clothes at the mall, they're not goth clothes anymore, right? <laughs> by the time by the time Walmart is carrying organic carrots, they're not selective anymore, yeah. right? It's just they're just not. Okay. Um, so he starts talking about gender identity, okay? By this, it was now possible to divorce oneself from one's biological being, okay? And that's part of the bit, okay, is for the longest time. Now, in certain pockets of academia, there were certainly people who were studying these things. And, uh, you know, the few things go from the mass popular culture up to the academy. It's always the other way around. Stuff starts up up here, they're thinking, they're thinking this way, and it eventually filters down, right? That's how it almost always works. It never comes the other way, okay? So certainly there have always been folks. Um, my understanding that Weimar Germany before World War II wasn't that wholesome of a place, right? I mean, it was, there was a lot of this kind of stuff going on there as well. And in big cities, you know, not so much out in Volo, right, in the 30s, but big cities. So it's, it's been going on. So gender identity, for the longest time, we just kind of thought, you're a guy or you're a gal. Yeah. And then eventually the academic stuff starts filtering down and it gets pushed into all the social media stuff. And now the discussion is you're assigned at birth, right? You are assigned at birth. Because what has happened now is the discussion about gender has been completely disconnected from any talk about your biology. That's how, that's how it works. That's why you can look, you can be, yeah, it's completely, dis, so gender has become completely disconnected from biology, so that way you can say that you are a woman and be at risk for prostate cancer. Because when you say you're a woman in your gender identity, it's completely separate from your biology. That's how, I mean, you get in, you get in some strange spots, right? Because I don't think either of you, either of you three, either of you five are at risk for prostate cancer, right? Because <laughs> your biology is not male. Us guys, we're at risk for prostate cancer, right? So that's a biological reality, okay? And so the, how it used to be talked about, and it probably still is, is that, and this is a little bit crude, uh, you know, your, your, your biological reality is what's between your legs and your gender identity is what's between your ears. So one of them is biologically based and the other is psychologically based-ish, is how people talk about it. And that's how you can get potential mismatches. And there are, there's no end of talk about uh, a, a female brain in a male body and a male brain in a female body. And we're, we're way down the road on this by now. Uh, if you ever want something horrifying to read, go to the Wikipedia and look up a fellow named John Money. He was a guy who was uh, uh, an early researcher or documented researcher in uh, gender assignment surgeries and things. And some of his early stuff is very, very, very terrible. With the twins? The twin study. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the twins at the circumcision, I think if I'm getting this right, at the circumcision of one of the twins, it got goofed somehow. And so they decided that they were gonna go all the way and raise him as a girl. And the doctor decided it. The doctor decided it. And on top of that, he would do experiments with him and with the twin brothers and take pictures of them and it was crazy. So there's some weird things going on there. 
Uh, so check out John Money on the Wikipedia sometime. Now Wikipedia, if you're not familiar much with the Wikipedia, it's it's a it's like a. Did, have everybody heard of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's essentially a real time set of encyclopedias. It's just that kind of conceivably anybody can edit it, as opposed to when the <laughs> when they put together a real book set of encyclopedias, they got people who knew what they're talking about. I think they police it pretty well. Um, but check out John Money on the Wikipedia, and then obviously with the sexual revolution stuff, Alfred Kinsey um, in Indiana, just craziness, absolute craziness. All right, so the gender identity bit. Um, a couple of years ago, Target, you can't go in and see uh, little boys, they don't have a boys section and a girls section marked. They're kind of all mixed together. It's not marked anymore in Target. Um, we're talking well, about Disney World here, and when we went to Disney World, there were still boys and girls. <laughs> now it's different. Yeah. So and you know, so it it, it filters into it's filtered into all sorts of places, obviously. Uh, discussions over who gets to play on what sports team, who gets to use what bathroom, when and where. Okay. Um, and the the interesting thing about this is, and my general take on stuff like this is that that there's probably a certain percentage of folks that if you sat them down with a trained clinician would have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria. And then there's a bunch of people that just don't like who they are and can say that they've got these things, and we're at a place where culturally we'll be like, well, yeah, sure, whatever, right? Then to layer on top of that, you've got uh, people who are just trying to get by and then people who are activists, right? So it's, it's complex as well. It's complex as well. Hmm. And uh, with something that's so personal, um, you know, there's a lot of heat and not always a lot of light, and you can get, you know, you can get in pretty big trouble these days if you misgender somebody publicly, right? Now, from the outside, as somebody who's never, who's, you know, I haven't always felt like my body is the greatest body, but I've never felt like I've been in the wrong body. So, as an outsider, it looks to me like people just can wake up and say, "I'm this and I'm that," right? That's what it feels like. Now, I'm sure it doesn't feel like it to them, right, to some. But there's also some data that this is a social contagion, particularly among females, where the, the rates of people that have identified themselves as being transgender, you know, was a certain thing, and then at a certain point it just went whoosh. And some of that they attribute to the strong social thing and... You know, I wish I had some better data to give you. But they call it a social contagion. It's almost like it's cool. Yeah. Down. There's a certain yeah. aspect of that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that can happen with anything. Mm -hmm. um, it can happen with where you live. It can happen with the car you drive. It can certainly, for high school kids, it's the band you do or don't like, right? So there's a certain aspect of that social bit. That, but... but uh, it seems to hit at a, at a different spot, right? As opposed to, um, so we're at an interesting cultural time here. One thing is that they say 60 to 70% of teenage girls have considered suicide. That's astounding. They just don't feel they fit, I guess. I was just gonna tell an experience that, that we had, our son is a doctor, and um, he had this young girl who came to him to sign off on her surgery to have her breast removed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was not her doctor doctor, but he had, you know, he was involved with her enough that she came to have him. And so he tried to have a conversation with her, you know, and um, as far as I could tell, he didn't give her advice. He didn't tell her no, he didn't tell her I'm gonna, and she wrote up a report about it because he questioned her. How old was she? 
she, I don't know, 16 or 18. See, I think there's still so many hormonal things going on. Mm-hmm. People aren't, you know, young people aren't sure who they are <laughs> until sometime in their 20s, if even. <laughs> right. And, and there's a, uh, so there's a little bit where we had a wave where, you know, again, I don't mean to be disparaging, but it seemed like at the drop of a hat, if somebody just said they were ready to do it, we were like right there. Right, mm-hmm. signing all the papers, and also there's a little bit of a money trail mm-hmm. in it, right? But I think some of this stuff, I think we're on the back end of some of the rushing stuff because some of the uh, northern European countries are are backing off of it, mm-hmm. and uh, so that cycle of it, you know, we may be in a downward hill on the, I on the hope fast so. stuff because years ago you had to go through psychological counseling oh, yeah. and like years and yeah, yeah yeah i mean it was such an irreversible thing yeah. i mean it is still irreversible mm-hmm. but, but the thing get, that of course worries me is and i pray about is because how can you, your doctor get involved in this and he's not involved in it mm-hmm. and they you can really they can put lawsuits to you yeah. and things like that that's, that's a shame job. that she did that to your son yeah, yeah and that's it's uh so these you know this is a real world example of of, uh, of a thing like that, and again, you know, it, and I haven't I haven't knuckled down and studied it, um, but the parallel of having this life altering in you know body altering stuff as the solution. Well, it's called gender affirming care, right? That's what they call it, gender affirming care. And it's a slippery term because if I come to you and I say, I want gender affirming care and I would like you to put some fake breasts on me, then you, then in that process, you've already agreed that I'm actually a woman, right? Because you're just affirming the gender that I feel that I am, right? But we don't treat other conditions like that. So if somebody was anorexic and said, boy, I am really overweight and they're 45 pounds we don't say well go ahead and don't eat right now there could be some some literature and some decent reason for this gender affirming care but again from the outside I've got some questions on that because we don't treat other things that way Um, so it's it's complex okay Uh, okay chapter 31 priest gods and shadows altering the desire Etc. 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 Gets down to uh, let's see. Over onto the page one thirty three, uh, the deconstruction of sex. Uh, sexuality could be removed from the context of marriage, as in the sexual revolution, and it could also be removed from the context of gender, as in the normalization of homosexuality. And he goes on and talks a little bit about, uh, lays the the framework for the Stonewall uh, event that he will talk about later. Then in chapter 32, he talks about uh, the surgery bit. Okay. The surgery bit. Um, And, you know, the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter whatever, you know, it's uh, castrating uh, people in the ancient Near East. I mean, it was a thing because if you needed somebody to be in charge of your harem, you get a dude to be in charge of your harem and you castrate him and he's not going to be tempted that way, right? Um, that was mostly Chinese though, wasn't it? I don't know, maybe. Yeah, it was very common in China, but yeah, I don't know of any other place. All right, um, then he talks about uh, the vulnerable there in 138. Um, that's where he talks about uh, this, this from t- down at the, uh, the last sentence, two from the bottom. From 2009 to 2018, the number of girls seeking gender transition treatments in the United Kingdom alone skyrocketed by a lot of percentages. That's a lot. Hmm. So, yeah. that's, so that's why they... Maybe there was one before. <laughs> so that's why they uh, I'm so bad you know <laughs> she said 
maybe it was just one way of working. But they have to pick up a percentage. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's great and crazy. Well, you can, you can bend statistics if you write anything. Oh, sure, yeah. You can, you can, you can. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's just, that's, I mean, I think we we got the, the main bit of what he's getting at this chapter. But again, this is the freshest one of the things that he's talked about, right? I, I remember when my friend said, have you heard anything about uh, about Bruce Jenner? And I said, no, I haven't heard about him forever. He said, I don't know, but you keep an eye on him. So, you know, you see Bruce Jenner and his, his hair's getting longer and his Adam's apple's a little less. And so that would have been around 2015-ish, somewhere in there, right? Yeah. So, and I remember after the Obergefell decision, I remember seeing um, on Time magazine that said basically kind of trans rights were the next thing after Obergefell. Like Time thought that that was the next frontier of rights in America. And it has, I mean, we are in the middle of it, right? Um, now, there's a guy who's a teacher at Grove City College, and his name is Carl Truman, and he's a... He's an Orthodox Presbyterian guy, I think he is. And he wrote a book called, kind of kind of chronicling how we find ourselves, one of the reasons we find ourselves in this position that we're in in our time with regard to these kinds of things. And that is um, that our notion of self trumps everything else now, okay? And there's always been an aspect where certainly Adam's notion of his right to rule his own life trumped God's desires for him, right? But we are, uh, we have reached a point due to some different philosophical things and things that have happened. Um, he traces them through the, philo- through the philosophy bit. Khan's trying to trace them through the religious bit, not that they're through the spiritual realm that you know one of the reasons that some of this stuff gets so um, heated is because when you talk to somebody about their sexuality it is so absolutely personal to them and it is personal right mm-hmm. um, that that explains why people defend it so or act the certain ways they do that the expression of the self is now seen as the highest good that's where we are. Express yourself. And uh, at Burger King, you have it your yeah. way, right? <laughs> now, again, Burger King is trying to get you to buy hamburgers from them, but they're appealing to this, you're the ruler of the world, right? Um, you know, have, uh, you can customize your iPhone with 50,000 different cases, and if you don't find a case that you like that suits your needs, We can make you one custom. So this enthronement of the self, and eventually what happened was, um, rather than, um, oh, and and so anything, the authentic self, I'm simply expressing my authentic self, and anything that gets in the way of me doing that, that's the problem, okay? So that's what Truman, uh, that's his read on, this current kind of situation, not simply with the transgender stuff, but with where we are humanity-wise in 20, I think you wrote it in 2020 or whatever, that the ascendancy of the authentic self and anything that gets in the way of me being my authentic self, well, that's the problem, right? And that helps to explain some of this thing because if there's no external standard that I need to be conforming to, then it's up to me to make who I am, right? And so if you can do away with God who has assigned, yeah, you were assigned male or female when you were conceived, or maybe a, you know, maybe a few uh, cell divisions thereafter, right? By the creator. It wasn't the doctor who, when you were born, looked between your legs and said, you did. I mean, the, the, biblically, that's where it is, right? Mm-hmm. Now, we do live in a world that is affected by sin, okay? So there are a very few amount of people who 
when their bodies started developing in their mother's wombs developed certain sex characteristics, either uh, sets of genitalia that are, that are both or ambiguous, right? Mm -hmm. but, but you can't, you can't do policy based on the, the, the exceptions, right? Okay, so we do live in a world where things can get, where wires can get crossed, right? But like the tiny bit of people are forcing their self on the majority. Well, and, and we also live in a country who says uh, everybody is not free until everybody has the same exact rights as everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's no, there's a God up here, but we can't tell you what he thinks. We can only tell you what the culture thinks because this is the way we vote, right? That's part of the bind, you know. Have you seen, there's somebody in Japan who was a dog now? I saw, I saw that. He <laughs> spent 40 big... some thousand on a dog suit. Yeah. Now he's going out in public. Oh, it's a, it's a cow. Well, you know. But the big question is, why do these stores and things go along like you mentioned, Target, why would they do that? If there's anybody putting pressure on it, it's a very, very small group of people. Mm -hmm. But they go do it, they just fall in line. Yeah. Why, does, why does that happen? Because right. it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Except common sense has disappeared. <laughs> I, you know, reflecting on the transgender bit <clears throat> has made me a little more open to his case about the other gods. <laughs> I mean, now I can tell you exactly why um, Target would do that, is that somebody in the big wig office at Target yes. says, we are gonna create culture, and also we would like to get people's money. So there's two bits there. They're creating culture, and they would also like to sell. You know, and why are they doing that? <laughs> I don't know. That's know. the interesting thing. Um, so, but in a world where, I mean, we're stuck in America with what? We, we call ourselves a democracy. We're technically a representative republic, right? But you're either going to have God's role, rules, or you're going to have demos. We're going to have the, the people's rules. It's never a case of are you going to have rules or not. You're always going to have rules. You, they're inescapable. Even to say you're not going to have a rule is what? To <laughs> make a rule, rule right? <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so it would, you know, I am, I am super duper open to weird spiritual things going on in boardrooms. Now, I can't, and it fries my brain because I can't chart it out on a spreadsheet for you. So I'm not going to make, I would never write a book about it because I feel like I can't back it up. But it sure is pretty fishy, right? Not to mention the fact that then, I mean, once you, once you don't have any breaks on that, you're wind up with the Trilateral Commission and the Illuminati and the Knights Templar and we never landed on the moon. And I mean, you get into all sorts of weird spots, right? All right. Um, well, at least this man knows he's a dog. But I'm just thinking of all the labels that I, I still do not understand, you know, binary and... and oh. Oh, the protein, the pronoun thing. <laughs> yeah, they have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah. Well, Gender yeah. fluid, and yeah. there's so many. There, there are, uh, they, I can't even. Those have proliferated quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And again, there's a certain, that, again, not having experienced any kind of dysphoria like that. Um, well, I remember, let me take a side note, I remember a guy who was experiencing some dysphoria, he said, it, is, it does not feel right for me to have my leg. And I would, I, it needs to be cut off. And he couldn't find a doctor to do it. So what he did was he packed it in dry ice and got in his car and waited long enough so that by the time he drove to the hospital, the damage would be so bad on his leg they would have to amputate it. That was on a, that was on a podcast. So he had this body dysphoria. Oh, jeez. Right? Yeah. So, so, you know, why, why would we not cut off a limb, but we'll certainly cut off other body parts? I mean, that, that doesn't, mm -hmm. right? I'd say probably the big difference, though, is that the guy wanting to lose his leg is probably a small minority 
Whereas there's an awful lot of people that feel that they're, you know, the other gender. Mm -hmm. But and, and the other thing is, you know, by comparison, I think probably you're probably you're probably right. But you can't rule out the social contagion bit of it. Mm -hmm. And um, and like I said, I am pretty comfortable with saying there are a, there is a swath of people who. Uh, you know, you get them in a room with a licensed therapist and they would give them a solid diagnosis of this dysphoria. Mm -hmm. But most of the people you see on TikTok, maybe not, right? Maybe not. Um, so, and it is, uh, it, is, it is certainly a challenge in a way that is fresh for us. Uh, and it also reminds us that if we're going to be exercised about stuff like this, we also need to be exercised about uh, the other things that he mentioned, about abortion, about uh, you know marriages falling apart, about all these other things. You know, it's not. There's a sense in which it's the most recent, but it's it's another one in the line of things that aren't God's design for His people mm -hmm. or for His world. Yeah, um, sin is sin. I mean, there's no <laughs> disparity sin. between it. The consequences might be different, but, yep. you know, sin is sin. And he really seems to fixate on some sins more than others. Well, but also, um, you know, this is the one that culturally has presented itself. Right? I don't think he's making it up out of whole cloth. Oh, no, no, no. Right? It's, it's, it's a 20 years thing. ago, we weren't trying to have a drag queen parade. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense in which, you know, I'll defend him a little bit because this is the, the cultural issue. Now, you know, in in 30 years, if he's like the guy that can't give up the Civil War and is still moving to the South, <laughs> then you're kind of like, well, OK, maybe yeah. fix it. Right. But, but know, this is the this yeah. is an issue of the time in the oh, way sure. that, that abortion was 50 years ago. Yeah. Right? But I think we've also discussed in here that. You know, when, when the society's rules are so oppressive, it almost always brings out a boomerang effect where then they go, phew, the other way. And, you know, and I think that has a lot to do with it, like with the gay pride parades and the um, yeah. flaunting the lifestyle and it's... And the donations to the hospital to promote these things. Right, right. You know what I don't see in his book? Anything about guns. Nothing no. about the fetishization of the gun culture in this country. And he could have, he, he could have, in his fashion, he could have snuck it in with Bale, because mm, Bale had yeah. the weapon, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You are right. I mean, we got, we got to worry about our kids. Like, when I was growing up, it was duck and cover. Right? <laughs> yeah. Remember that? I had oh, that, yeah. too. We had, oh, yeah. we had, we had a nuclear bomb, bomb, yeah. bomb going on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, now yeah. it's it's like it's gonna like, do anything. Yeah. I don't know what, but kids have to worry about somebody walking into a yeah, they, school. They have yeah. active shooter drills. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the scariest thing. So they're not worried about nuclear war anymore. No, they're worried. Yeah, no, they have drills, and I even if there's, I know the schools around here have been in soft lockouts a lot. All right. We used to have active shooter drills at my place of employment oh, every year. Yeah. I've got uh, for you for your perusal. We have a, an EPC position paper on human sexuality. It was rewritten a few years ago in 2017. And so I'll just give, this is, you know, if somebody says, Pastor Chris, what does the EPC teach about this? This is our official position paper. So I'll just leave that for you to peruse. Um, it talks about the d divine origin and purpose of human sexuality. You know, God made us male and female. He made us complementary to be together, to, to have offspring. And it talks a little bit about the fall. Um, talks about you know, God being uh, authority to define us and regulate our sexual practice. Uh, and it, it tries to, in a very, just a few paragraphs, kind of get at a broader uh, thing about sexual sexuality. And then one of the reasons they wanted to rewrite is they wanted to talk about the single life. Okay, there is a valid category biblically of celibacy. Um, so we added that, the married life, um, et cetera, et cetera. 
a recovering from sexual brokenness. Um, it's not just a heterosexual or a homosexual deal. Sexual brokenness is all over the place. And then it kind of sums up by trying to get in with what the church's response is. Um, so I'll just leave that to you. As I was thinking through the thing, I always try to give it at least some kind of a resource. Um, so, you know, as I struggle with this, you know, what is, uh, we can we can see this stuff that's going on, and it's easy to diagnose, or somewhat easy to diagnose that it's happening, but um, I'm, and I'm not very good at this, but I'm never in favor of, oh, we got together and just uh, trounced on a current issue for 35 minutes, and we left, and we all... There's nothing for us to do, right? I mean, what can you do about this stuff? Um, and uh, I, I, boy, I don't know about this stuff. Other than, you know, my sphere of influence is about a circle, about 50 feet around me. Right? I don't have, you know, I can, we can write our governor, we can do these, those kinds of things. Um, but my sphere of influence, I don't fool myself into thinking that what I think about this is going to influence national policy. Uh, I don't think I'm the right person for that. I think there are people that are like that, but I don't think I'm one of those. So what do we do about this stuff? Well, I, what I was wondering is, is this put into practice? In what? In preaching in Congress. I mean, it doesn't apply here because we're mostly all retired. But is this being put into practice? As far as in, what goes. In normal Christian churches. As far as what goes. Is it being dealt with? I, I suppose that means by <laughs> what you mean by is it being dealt with. Um, preaching on it? Sunday school? I'm sure there probably are people that are preaching on it and talking about it in Sunday school. Um, and it, yeah. Uh, because you can write a paper, but unless something happens because of that paper you can uh you haven't gotten anywhere there are certain ways you can uh abandon things one is change them and two is ignore them right yeah. right i'm very encouraged reading the the quickly coming through but getting to the end where there's still that compassion and yeah. that's what has impressed me about the epc yeah is that there's always compassion because jesus has got to look at compassion and with on a lot of these people who are just suffering. They wish they weren't that way. They, you know, it's not like they chose it. That's how they feel or that's what they say. And, and yeah, and it's, uh, it's probably one of the messier bits. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, even, even if you went to uh, San Francisco, you would see a sign that says "Love is Love," and that's not as all-encompassing as they would as it would appear, right? Because I'm sure a lot of folks that would have that sign would draw the line somewhere, right? Only God is love, really. <laughs> <laughs> right, but but you know, you know the the all, love is love sign is you should be okay with who I'm choosing to love. And that, that kind of feels like it creates a big tent, but if you were to say, well, should you, you know, say I want to love a 13-month-old child, is that okay? Well, no, that's terrible. Okay, then not all love is love, right? Not all love is love. Um, but, you know, slogans only get you so far. Slogans are handy sometimes, but they're not, they're not, they're not cure-alls for, for anything. They're certainly short and rallying cries. All right, so, um, you know, certainly there's some learning to do. Uh, it, I feel like we're kind of on the, the downward hill slide of the urgency to surgically alter people. Um, you know, then there are stories of people who have had these surgeries and they say it did not, it didn't. They're still there, unhappy. Yeah, and there are probably some who had some of the surgeries and said, I'm, I'm feel, I feel better. Yeah. Um, but for a while, you know, the, any pushback against this was certainly discouraged. And now we're 
to the point where the pushback can is is happening some. Um, but again, you know, what do we do with this? Certainly, you pray. Certainly, you uh, you work to to share the Lord Jesus with people, because ultimately, He's the one. He's the one that matters about all this stuff. All right. Well, I can remember years ago when the LGBTQ started, you know, and, and you think, well, that's fine if they want to be that way. Just, you know, they can be they what they want to be. be LGBTQ. But they've become so political and so... Um, well, because they've they, had to deal with being in the closet and yeah, shame for so long. That's, they, they boomerang. <laughs> yeah, it's they, like any social movement. Well, and, uh, yeah, and it's a weird... There's a weird dynamic there where the oppressed can also become oppressors. Oh yeah, um, yeah. And so yeah, and and it, and I feel the weight of it a little bit because uh, one of my college roommates uh, married a fellow a couple of years ago, and in and in order to take a swipe at the activist, my friend is going to be on the same side. So if I'm trying to punch at the activist and I miss, I'm going to hit my friend who's over here, but he's not an activist, but ultimately he's on that side. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's from an emotional point of view, it's difficult. Theologically, it's not difficult at all, right? If, if we were just, if we could just flip switches and things would work or get fixed or be the way we wanted, there's no question in my mind, right? But it's this interaction with people. No, know. it's when a family member, or, you know, somebody you love. Right. Right. Then you've got to. And you want the best for them. Right. You love you love them, but you don't love the sin. You hate the sin. Right. Right. Um, and, <coughs> but this is an interesting one because if somebody came to you and said, I mean, we wouldn't encourage somebody who's a racist to be a better racist. <laughs> Right? We wouldn't help them to do that better, right? We would still love them. So there's, you know. But certainly this is the, the, the hottest topic for, for this book. For the, for, you know, it's the most recent one. So I am not uh, terribly excited about the next section where he's going to make his case about Stonewall. Um, I am most looking forward to uh, how he tries to wrap it up. Has anybody gotten to the end? I was listening to a podcast and uh, these people were talking about it and there this the one way it was like just read the last chapter. <laughs> just skip all the front part just go straight to the last chapter it's the best one. So I hope uh, I hope that's I hope, I hope it's good. I'm interested I know it may say where does this information come from only the bible or is he going back to some of the Sumerian oh, yeah, tablets. They, yeah, you look at his footnotes there. And, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. That's where I pulled that, that yeah. sheet from. All right, let me pray for us. Uh, Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you that one day uh, all these significant issues that are dealt with in this book will be a byword. And uh, the new heavens and the new earth have arrived. Uh, the Lord Jesus is shining in all His radiant glory. We are with Him and we are 100% free from our sin. And yet, uh, Father, we know that between now and then You ask us to work toward that end. And so, Father, give us wisdom. Um, in the meantime, how You would have us get this good news out. Uh, that people can be free from uh, all sorts of stuff only in the Lord Jesus Christ. So give us wisdom, Father, uh, by your word and through your spirit. I thank you for everyone here. We remember the folks that have joined with us in the past that aren't with us tonight, that you would lead them and guide them as well. And Father, we ache and long for the day when all the sad things become untrue. And we ask that you would hasten that day in the Lord Jesus Christ. But <laughs> Father, we know in your mercy you are waiting uh, until the final sheep has heard the call. So uh, use us in that work, Father. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen and amen. 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 All right. Thank you all.